Good afternoon, North Dakota, and uh, happy Easter, happy Good Friday to everyone. Uh, as we enter this uh, holiday weekend, uh, this is an opportunity for us to uh, reflect on all the blessings that we have as North Dakotans. It's an opportunity to renew our faith, and it's an opportunity to strengthen our connection with our families and friends, uh, even as we might have to do that uh, remotely. Uh, we know that today, Good Friday, is an important day for many North Dakotans uh, and the billions of people around the world that celebrate Easter. Uh, so it's appropriate today that we'll begin with a prayer from Lieutenant Colonel John Weimer, who's the uh, state uh, staff chaplain for the North Dakota National Guard. And of course, as Lieutenant Colonel Weimer comes up here, we also say thank you to all of those National Guardsmen who have always served our state with distinction and continue to do so during this health emergency. Lieutenant Colonel. Feel free to join me as I pray. Almighty God, we come to you on this Good Friday, still a state holiday here in North Dakota, and still a day when many of us are mindful of the suffering and death of Jesus Christ. As we come to a holiday when many people travel and connect with family, we are mindful of how different our lives are this year. I ask that you help us be patient with the changes in many areas of our life and help us to see how important our actions are for the good of our community. We lift up to you all those who are personally struggling with COVID-19, whether they're in the hospital or at home, and we lift up to you all those working on the front lines of this battle as they work long days and weeks. We are grateful to you for your presence and strength and ask for your blessing on the people of the great state of North Dakota and the United States. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lieutenant Colonel. Uh, we're grateful for your service and we're grateful for all of the faith-based leaders across the state of North Dakota who are uh, working and innovating uh, to work with their congregations uh, these past few weeks and this weekend. Uh, we know that uh, health of individuals is related to spiritual health, uh, for sure, and spiritual health supports mental health, supports resilience, uh, supports community. And we want to, again, thank these leaders because so many of them have found creative ways to hold worship services while still adhering to social distancing guidelines, uh, whether those are virtual services on social media. Uh, we've even heard of uh, parking lot services where people stay in their cars but tune into the same radio frequency to hear the pastor. Uh, as we head into this weekend, we know that that not just that our nation was founded on freedom of religion, but uh, actually when we think about the, the earliest settlers uh, that arrived in the 1600s from Europe uh, came to America even before there was a the United States and they came here uh, for reasons of religious freedom. So we know this is a deep foundation in our, our country, uh, but even with that, with that religious freedom, we urge people to continue to follow the CDC guidance and not gather this weekend in groups of 10 or more. And if you do maintain social distancing, uh, this is of course a voluntary guidance, not an order, uh, but we, we are aware uh, that there have been uh, breakouts that have been traced back to congregations. And given the, that demographically, a lot of the people that would traditionally attend on Easter uh, include uh, our elderly in the state, uh, we want to again make sure that we're protecting them. So again, we again congratulate and share our gratitude with all of those, those faith-based leaders that have found ways uh, to continue to look after the spiritual health of their congregation, uh, but do that in a way where during this time when we have a contagious and deadly disease that we can protect those lives of North Dakotans. Uh, at the same time, we practice great spiritual health. We can be practicing great physical health. Uh, <clears throat> We know that uh, switching to the Easter holiday, uh, we also know that there's other traditions that go with it, uh, depending on uh, your family. Uh, many times this does mean traveling and being with uh, relatives, being together as family, particularly in a multi-generational way. We know that that's going to be hard on both young kids and on grandparents because this is a deep time of connection. Uh, and so again, we, our empathy goes out for those families that will be physically separated this weekend. Uh, but know that, uh, as we've said, you're 
your your sacrifice by not being together may in fact uh, you know save the lives of your loved ones and so we uh, we appreciate all that you're doing uh, in exercising that individual responsibility among families particularly across generations uh, we also know that there in, among uh, many uh, in our state there are certain traditions that go along uh, with Easter uh, including the uh, Easter egg hunts. Uh, typically, there's even an Easter egg hunt here at the Capitol, which, of course, is not happening this weekend. Uh, but we do have some good news for those people that are uh, focused on Easter egg hunts, because today I did sign a proclamation uh, declaring the Easter Bunny as an essential worker, uh, and so that the uh, Easter Bunny, along with other magical creatures, including the Tooth Fairy, in case you eat too much candy, uh, Easter candy this weekend, and you have a tooth that comes out, uh, the Tooth Fairy is also an essential worker and so uh, both of those are relieved so again uh, I won't read the whole proclamation it'll be online but now therefore as governor of the state of North Dakota to hereby complain or proclaim that the Easter Bunny the Tooth Fairy and other magical creatures are deemed essential workers in the state of North Dakota so long as they follow ND smart guidelines while carrying out their critical work uh, so that signed and posted as of today uh, so thank you to the Easter Bunny and for our diligent uh, and space uh, s s practicing safe spacing uh, media team that's been here uh, each of you at your desk more than six feet apart you'll find an Easter basket uh, for you and I guess it's really not a basket it's an Easter brown bag uh, but thank you uh, again to the media that's been coming uh, here and uh, we wish you and all of the people in our state a happy Easter getting into the case numbers for today uh, We've got some, some good news and, and some sad news. Uh, the good news right off the top is uh, nine positives reported out of uh, another great testing day, 618 tests uh, that were completed through the labs across the state. That's a 1.5% positive rate. That's uh, less than half of what are, are been trending on the seven week average. That's one of the numbers we really pay attention to, to see if the curve is climbing in North Dakota. And it's not, it's actually uh, adding in that 1.5 for today has dropped us down to a 2.9% seven day rolling average. And, and that's, a, we get to 2.9%. Uh, nine uh, based on again the tests of the last week uh, so that is uh, that's all the positive news uh, that's in there that's great news we did uh, yesterday report yesterday that there was a, a death that wasn't in yesterday's number a man in his 70s from Stark County with underlying health conditions uh, that is in today's number that's what moves us up to six uh, but there's a sadly uh, since this morning's 11 o'clock report uh, we ha have to report another uh, death in our state uh, that would bring the t tomorrow's total uh, to, to seven uh, but we're unable to share details uh, at this time uh, any specifics but we do know that it was a woman in her 70s with underlying health conditions uh, acquired through community spread uh, but no more details pending notification of family uh, again Catherine and I extend our deepest condolences to the family members uh, you know particularly on this holiday weekend uh, who've lost a loved one uh, to the deadly COVID-19 disease uh, we want to uh, also really highlight another uh, important thing on the bottom of that page that we've got the the nine numbers on is the number 13 uh, that is the number of people currently hospitalized uh, that uh, uh, number is down but it's down it was down from 14 to 13 uh, for the wrong reason it was because that represents the individual in Stark County who who we mentioned yesterday was hospitalized uh, and that passed away uh, but it does still reflect the current number of hospital beds in the state of North Dakota that are utilized by uh, by people with uh, COVID-19 disease uh, but again the math that we want to focus on people you know are uh, paying a lot of attention to are we going to have enough hospital capacity it's one of the things we're working diligently as a state uh, next week you'll hear more about our surge uh, capacity planning but again that uh, we are almost couldn't be further away from needing tier three surge capacity because those 13 uh, hospital beds today represent less than one percent uh, of the hospital beds in our state it's really probably less than a half of one percent of the beds uh, in the state so we we are another way of saying this is 99 percent of the hospital capacity is is available and again we uh, 
appreciate all of those providers out there that have, uh, many of them have uh, voluntarily stopped uh, doing elective surgery. Uh, they've dr drawn down their occupancy counts uh, in preparation uh, for the potential need. But right now, like I said, we're well positioned and well prepared uh, if we're gonna have an increase uh, in that. Uh, the next uh, slide is one we've been showing you, but again, uh, this is a, a, again above the line on this slide shows the number of active cases. That's really what we have to deal with right now. We were up plus four on active cases is all from 163 to 167. And we did have uh, four more uh, recoveries. Uh, so we've got 105 people uh, that have re recovered. And so that is, uh, again, positive news in terms of we talk about flattening the curve. We are absolutely have the curve hasn't even started heading up yet in North Dakota. We've been basically as percentage of positives uh, and this you know slight creeping up of active cases uh, again we like the trend lines that we're at and and so uh, that part is the good news we continue to hear uh, questions about you know testing and are we doing enough and again the, the key measure of of where we have hot spots or not is the number of positive cases divided by the number of tests and we're showing that here by county and you can see uh, on this slide that uh, Montreal County, Oliver County, uh, Dunn County, uh, Burke County, all of those are, or Grant County, those are all, the shaded a little darker, those are all uh, at 5% or more uh, in terms of positives uh, in those counties per test completed. Uh, Cass County at 4.3 uh, is slightly above that rolling average, and and, and uh, Grand Forks County, which has at least so far uh, had a, a low number of positives, is down at 1.3 percent. Uh, continues to be very low up in Grand Forks, but uh, on an absolute number, because of the highest population in the state is in Cass County, our most populous county by far. Uh, that's where we'll have the absolute most number of cases. But as a percentage of a population, it's not considered a high spot compared to other counties and we are again as we dial up our capability which we practiced last weekend in terms of being able to do uh, testing we will be this weekend uh, conducting uh, some uh, testing uh, which would in, in some of our hotspot areas to try to make sure that we're really able to identify uh, and then do the appropriate targeted uh, isolation quarantine to slow the spread in those areas where we're showing a high percentage uh, the next topic is not related to uh, <clears throat> to uh, uh, COVID, uh, but it's an important uh, briefing which we wanted to bring up, uh, which is, uh, is spring. We're fortunate that we haven't had massive spring flooding happening at exactly the same time. We were doing planning uh, starting back in December because of the high probability of flooding, uh, or, you know, particularly in the eastern third of the state. And uh, we've just recently announced that I-29 uh, is closed in both directions uh, between uh, the Manville, uh, the Manville exit, which is by Grafton and just north of Grand Forks. So there's over 20 miles in both lanes that are closed. Uh, if you, again, if you haven't down loaded your uh, ND Roads app from the North Dakota uh, Department of Transportation. It's a great little mobile app you can have on your phone, uh, which uh, will will indicate in those red lines that those are closed. Uh, I do believe that there is a route around there. Uh, again, for uh, if you're out doing essential travel where you can get on Highway 81, uh, it takes you a little longer, but you can uh, do a loop around and end up getting back on the open portion of the interstate uh, north of where it is closed. Uh, <clears throat> Next up, we want to talk about uh, child care. And we gave an executive order uh, back March 26th because, again, keeping everybody working in our state, uh, it was uh, important that we keep the child care sector going in our state. 71% uh, as you see on this slide of, of North Dakota children age zero to five have, you know, all have, have both parents uh, that are in the workforce. 78% of children age six to 12 have got all parents in the workforce. So as, it, as would be expected in a state like ours, where it had very low unemployment till a month ago, and a vast majority of, of, of families had two working parents uh, with the high workforce participation and the strong work ethic in our state. So not surprising. Uh, and child care in North Dakota, unlike K through 12, gets enormous uh, support from government. Higher education uh, gets a lot of support from, from uh, government. Uh, 
Child care, not so much. Child care is largely the, the over 1,600 uh, organizations that deliver child care in their state, largely small business owners, uh, privately run uh, organizations, but they are, they are essential services. So we did uh, <clears throat> put together a child care emergency operating grant to help and sustain that North Dakota's vital, vital ch child care sector during this time. We also announced modified operating guidance for child care providers that aligned with the CDC and Department of Health. And uh, that guidance dealt with daily health screenings, how to maintain clean environments, how to manage meals and play at the right distance, supporting safe distancing by limiting groups, rearranging physical space, modifying activities, uh, and, and requiring them to have uh, in those, those smaller groups meant essentially that we were requiring them to increase their costs because they had to have more staff uh, per number of uh, children cared for. Uh, our goals remain the same, which is support the health and safety of children, family, and child care providers. Number two, assure uh, that health care professionals and other lifeline workers uh, who are also parents have access to quality and safe licensed child care as they continue to provide their essential services during this pandemic. And three was to sustain the child state's child care industry, which is vital to supporting workforce now, but will be certainly essential as we as our state recovers from the pandemic. So today I I signed an executive order that formalizes the modified operating guidance and the emergency grant program that we had discussed earlier. Uh, and this includes uh, lifting and cutting through some red tape related to licensure and operating requirements uh, while still maintaining the safety of all those children, but it does allow uh, these organizations to conform with the mitigation measures uh, issued by the CDC and our state health department. <clears throat> and then last week, I wanna thank the State Emergency Commission. The Emergency Commission is made up of the House and Senate uh, majority leaders and the House and Senate uh, appropriations chairs, along with the Secretary of State and myself, and that six-person body uh, proved unanimously uh, to establish the the grant program for child care providers with uh, 60 or with 36 million dollars that has become available in federal funds through the Federal CARES Act. Uh, so I want to thank those House and Senate Majority Leaders and the appropriate chairs, Secretary of State, for their approval on the Emergency Commission today. We issued the first payments uh, that went out the door to license and self declared that's another description uh, of licensing but they're also licensed but to license child care providers in North Dakota who applied for North Dakota's child care emergency operating grants and 572 uh, participating licensed care providers uh, received uh, payments today and again well those uh, payments may seem small on a per child basis this could be the difference between them being able to stay open or have to close uh, and again, uh, only programs that continue to be open and serve children uh, with the priority of those whose parents are vital service workers uh, and then, and, and then they meet those two criteria, and they apply, those are the ones that received a payment. So if you're out there, you're open, and you're serving uh, children of vital service workers, I uh, encourage you to apply for this program. And uh, again, uh, great work, I wanna thank uh, Chris Jones and his team, Jessica Thomason, and all those uh, that, that work diligently to do all the work, uh, both on the federal side, the state side, to put together this program and want to thank those child care operators, those entrepreneurs that are out there that have been providing child care during this really challenging time. For those that, that are meeting this criteria but haven't applied, it's not too late. If you're a licensed child care provi provider, it's still time to apply. And again, this is an opt-in for child care centers. Uh, so it's it's not mandatory, but it's an opt-in to apply for the child care emergency operating grants. And uh, and so so with that, uh, we know under this timeline, we said the uh, modified operating practice take place uh, March 30, uh, and the first child care operating grants would be made today, April 10th. So we are on schedule and on time with what we had announced earlier. If you want more information, you can go to the Human Services website at uh, www.nd.gov forward slash DHS, click on the COVID button, and details are in the provider resources area. 
We got another executive order today, uh, and this is an amendment to a prior executive order related to uh, isolation and quarantine for family and household members. When someone in the household tests positive for COVID-19, uh, this change is driven by uh, some new, more specific, and, and slightly, in some cases, more flexible guidance from the CDC. And I'll invite State Health Officer Mylin Tufty to come up to talk about this. Mylin. Thank you, Governor Burgum. On April 6th, the governor issued an executive order 2020-21 regarding quarantine for individuals who test positive and as well as for their family and household members. On Wednesday, through a state health officer order, I expanded the executive order to clarify the length of quarantine for individuals who test positive and to include immediate isolation upon notification for at least seven days after the onset of symptoms and 72 hours after becoming fever-free with symptom improvement. Today, I'm issuing a state health officer order to expand on the executive order that was mentioned um, to allow for exemptions for essential workforce. This, and for family and household contacts of individuals who test positive for COVID-19. Household contact is considered residents in the same household or residential premises. Like our other orders, the individuals who are exempt from this order include essential critical infrastructure workers as defined by the United States Department of Homeland Security. Employers should Follow the CDC guidelines that were updated this week to implement safety practices for employees who've had exposure to a person or a suspected person that had COVID-19. These include pre-screening temperatures and assessing for symptoms prior to letting them start work. Having the person wear a face mask at all times while in the workplace for 14 days after the last exposure maintaining six feet and practicing social distancing as work duties permit, routinely cleaning and disinfecting all areas such as offices, bathrooms, common areas, and shared electronic equipment. Should an employee become sick during the day, they should be sent home immediately and surfaces in their workplace should be cleaned and disinfected these CDC guidelines, as well as the state health officer order, can be found at our website, healthnd.gov, health.nd.gov. In addition to the order, our recommendation for all close contacts remains the same. If you can stay home, please do. For 14 days past the last day that you were in contact with a person who tested positive. Having people self-isolate and remain apart whenever possible is one of the best ways that we're going to stop the spread of this disease and return to normal. Thank you. Thank you, Mylin. And thank you and thank everybody at the Department of Health for all their incredible work they're doing. Uh, for the uh, media that's here, uh, we're and for those that are home that are following this, as we learn new words, uh, we want to provide some uh, clarification that we're going to be using going forward uh, on isolation versus quarantine. So this is just, uh, what do you call it? This is called a Webster's Dictionary moment. Isolation. When a person is showing symptoms uh, or has tested positive a disease and they separate themselves from other people to prevent spreading the disease to others. That's isolation. So if you've got it or, you know, or showing symptoms, you think you're positive, you presume positive, you put yourself in isolation. Quarantine, that's when you're a person who is exposed to the disease through close contact, uh, but you do not yet have symptoms, uh, but you separate themselves from others for a period of time to prevent potentially spreading the disease to others. So that's why, again, when we're talking about isolation versus quarantine, uh, again, this 14 days of quarantine would be from the last time an individual was exposed to a case while well, the case was contagious. That Those definitions will be available on health.nd.gov, uh, but for those that are 
that are quarantining. Again, we thank you because that kind of target of di disciplined uh, individual responsibility uh, is helping us slow the spread. And of course, people that are in isolation should be in isolation because those are people that know they have it uh, or waiting for the test or, or have tested uh, or have tested positive or symptomatic. So thank you both. If you're either in isolation or quarantining, uh, we say thank you because you're the heroes that are helping slow the spread. Next topic, uh, housing. You know, during this emergency, uh, it becomes more important than ever. But even without the emergency, we know that one of the one of the fundamentals of health is access to safe and stable housing, and and it's a challenging uh, during uh, periods of whenever we have an economic downturn we see increases in the amount of people accessing shelters we see increases in the amount of homelessness and so when this uh, whole economic downturn started uh, one of the things we did is we put together a work group uh, from Department of Human Services the governor's office from Department of Commerce Department of Labor Department of Health Housing Finance Agency uh, BND and others to make sure that we were working about on housing in a comprehensive way uh, whether it's homeowners with mortgages, people that rent, uh, or people who are at the risk of becoming homeless. I'd now uh, like to invite our DHS Executive Director, Chris Jones, to come up and share progress on one of those components of the housing work group, uh, which it relates to homelessness. Chris? Thank you, Governor. First, I think just to understand the need. I think we've heard a lot about talk about working from home, staying at home, but that presupposes that you have a home. We've also talked a lot about washing our hands, but that presupposes you have access to clean water. If we don't have access to safe, affordable housing, we can't meet two of the criteria to prevent the spread of this virus. So working together, the housing team has been working together to make sure North Dakota has a good strategy for addressing housing and homeless needs that have been exacerbated by the COVID emergency. We are working together with local private sector partners to help people who are experiencing housing crisis find their way through it. This oftentimes can be very difficult. And with the private sector housing market to do what we can to help ensure that the housing market in North Dakota will be strong and ready to serve not only during the COVID emergency, but well beyond. It is essential that we pay attention to housing if we want to continue to grow North Dakota's economy. In addition to directing resources to the existing local infrastructure that exists in North Dakota, whether that be homelessness, unstable or unsafe housing situations, or possibly eviction, stay stably housed. As federal funds start to flow into North Dakota to help ensure we can address the needs of our state, these agencies that the governor previously mentioned, along with our local and private partners, are working to, together to ensure these increased dollars are put to use effectively. So how are we addressing this during the COVID emergency? We want to make sure that people who need to be quarantined due to COVID exposure have a safe place to lay their head at night. Additionally, we want to make sure that anyone who is COVID-19 positive and experiencing homelessness will have a safe place. And we recognize how important it is for people who are unsheltered and living in a car or on the streets to have access to shelter for all of the reasons mentioned above. Through the newly formed State Interagency Task Force on Homelessness, Domestic Violence, and Food Insecurity, we have established safe housing options for individuals who are currently homeless and unsheltered, victims of domestic violence, and individuals and families who need to be quarantined or isolated due to COVID-19. Starting next week, these units will be available across the state and will be coordinated among existing shelters and providers, the Department of Human Services, the Department of Health, and many other supporting agencies, providers, and programs. But I think it's important we realize that we are building for the future. And by having a coordinated effort to help people stay or become stably housed, we are also preventing homelessness and relieving some of the pressure that the state's homeless shelters are experiencing as they continue to operate at capacity. We are committed to not doing anything today that doesn't contribute to our long-term success as a state. 
and we are working hard to make sure any new initiatives we support are well thought out, well monitored, and targeted, targeted to meet specific identified North Dakota needs. April is Fair Housing Month, and today we received um, a letter from Ben Carson, the Secretary for Housing and Urban Development, to remind us the principles that underlie our nation's commitment to fair housing. I wanted to read an excerpt from his statement as I think it serves as a good reminder for all of us. The Fair Housing Act embodies the spirit of this great nation where everyone is entitled to equal opportunity and respect. We need to be attentive to the heightened protections and needs of family, friends, and neighbors who are older, who have disabilities, or pre-existing medical conditions. We also need to honor and support the medical professionals and caregivers who selflessly go to the front line to serve and heal, and we must be creative and compassionate to keep each other safely sheltered, healthy, and prepared. Right now, in the spirit of fair housing, we need to be the best neighbors we can for one another. We are very grateful to all the local organizations who help deliver much needed economic stabilization to North Dakota residents every day, from community action agencies, to homeless shelter providers, and to human service zones. In the coming days and weeks, you can find more information on housing and homelessness at ndresponse.gov, including more details on the state's specific responses to the housing issues facing families across the state. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. I, I want to just uh, put some uh, additional remarks on this. Uh, we, we've had, uh, you know, again, when we're in a health emergency, it's easy to focus on the health aspects. So I know in our major markets, we've had a lot of attention played on, paid, including you know, front page stories on the paper of, you know, cots and gymnasiums uh, with this vision that somehow we might end up like McCormick Place or the Javik Center in New York, where we're going to have be trying to do minimal care facilities. Uh, we're doing everything in our power uh, to make sure that doesn't happen. And North Dakotans are stepping up with individual responsibility, and that individual responsibility is showing in the numbers. And at least so far, we don't see any any plans where we would be uh, in anywhere in the near term or near future be accessing that. But there is a reality that there's another another uh, shelter that is not on the front page that could end up becoming overwhelmed, and that's our domestic violence shelters, our homeless shelters, uh, places where people might seek refuge uh, when they've lost their housing due to economic hardship. And that's what Chris and the team are really working on, is the one that we that exists today, uh, often invisible to many people in North Dakota, the people that are uh, moving in and out. Often we think of homelessness maybe as a chronic condition uh, that is the responsibility of that individual, but reality, homelessness, uh, there's churn in homelessness. People become homeless for uh, a month or two until they find an, an, you know, a new situation. Uh, maybe it's more prolonged. Uh, but this is, again, we also know that there can be uh, overlap uh, between uh, addiction, uh, mental health, behavioral health, uh, can all overlap with, with uh, housing or lack of housing. And this is all compounded during periods of time when we have a big drop in economic activity, which is we're in right now. We've had basically had the ball, bottom fallout of our economy in a way that is uh, never been seen, not even in the 1930s. And so I'm super happy that the team is proactive, and I'm super happy that they're working on a comprehensive plan. And, and the uh, plans that are put, being put forth uh, could also be, uh, again, will include the private sector and nonprofits. And so again, when we have this federal money coming in that are at state's discretion to use, we've got an opportunity to be able to support those nonprofits and the private sector uh, that is providing housing to make sure that we have a, a you know, we're again, by spending dollars, we're saving dollars because just like if you can prevent uh, someone from starting smoking when they're young, you prevent uh, medical costs over the rest of your life. If we can prevent homelessness by supporting the existing system today and with wraparound services for people, we can save a lot of money in the long term. And this is what this federal dollars uh, that are being provided to the states help us do this. So again, great job uh, to Chris and team. And we'll look forward as that continues to roll out in the weeks ahead. Uh, and as you work with those providers 
in those coalitions. Uh, next up uh, on unemployment, <clears throat> Uh, we want to uh, give some highlights here, uh, and there's a, we won't walk through all the data on this uh, graph, but we did want to make sure that those are really interested in unemployment data. There's actually a separate website we have not show, uh, shown before, but it's NDLMI, which is North Dakota Labor Market Index.com. Uh, this is populated by all the data that comes from uh, North Dakota Job Service, and you can find uh, most of the things that you're looking for and the questions that we might have there. But I do want to highlight that since March 16th, we've now processed over 45,497 claims. Uh, we've accepted uh, just under 4,000 pandemic, pandemic unemployment assistance. And this is for individuals not eligible for regular extended benefits, including independent contractors, self-employed and gig workers. Uh, so people are hearing about that and that's a great uh, safety net. And then the pandemic emergency unemployment compensation, this is the one that provides additional uh, 13 weeks of benefits for individuals that may have exhausted all their rights to state unemployment. Uh, and this will primarily assist those individuals who might have been seasonal workers laid off in the fall who have used up all their benefits, but due to the pandemic are not being called back to work. Uh, 37 and 30 have, have uh, applied for that. And then we've heard a lot two weeks ago about the additional $600 uh, that check that we give into each individual for unemployment insurance benefit made on top of their regular unemployment insurance. And that is the federal pandemic unemployment compensation and the, the job services in the process of implementing that. And a few highlights, uh, over 20 million in benefit payments have gone out the door. Uh, we also appreciate people's patience. Uh, been, there have been a lot of calls. Uh, again, encourage people to check the website for the frequently asked questions because you might be able to get all of your questions answered there. But if you do choose to call, uh, you might have to wait. The average wait time has been uh, just slightly under 14 minutes. That average means some might be longer than that, some might be faster than that. Uh, but we do know uh, that with the uh, record number of unemployment claims coming around the country that our hardworking team, which has been backed up with extra staff, uh, is one of the lowest, if not the lowest wait time uh, in the nation uh, right now at that 14 minute average. So thank you for your patience if you're calling, but check the website first. And then that team over there that has now done more than two years of claims in the last two weeks, uh, they've processed or adjudicated 14,000 451 issues uh, that come up on uh, unemployment claims, uh, and they've worked that backlog uh, all the way down uh, to just under 4,000. But again, thank you for the hard work that everybody is doing over there. Uh, it's really been amazing. They've processed over 64,000 weekly certi certifications and on and on and on. Uh, the work that they did to do the mainframe and other technology program changes, that was completed, and we were able to eliminate uh, that way week so the system now we can waive that was completed on April 7th payments were being made on April 8th so more good news uh, there uh, and again uh Again, thank you to that whole team, uh, but we do have people that have been working nights and weekends, and I'm sure they'll continue to work uh, over the weekend. Also want to thank, thank the NDIT team uh, and the job service NDIT programmers that have been working days and nights uh, to keep uh, coding and keep the mainframe uh, going over there. So thank you to that entire team. Uh, the Again, questions on any of that? Uh, jobsnd.com, uh, which is uh, preferred if you can uh, check the website before before calling. Uh, in closing today, a uh, couple things. One is I want to talk about the CARE 19 app. Uh, as you know, uh, this is a uh, continued to uh, <clears throat> uh, roll out across the country. We've had over uh, over uh, close to 14,000 downloads, uh, 22,000 place visits have been logged so far, and, and again, uh, that continues to show additional interest from lots of other states. I think uh, the, the developer has been, of this app has been contacted by 16 other states. And then earlier today, uh, there was a major announcement that Apple and Google, who generally are competitors, are teaming up to work on a app uh, that would help uh, an individual identify whether or not you're, you're uh, associated or close contact with someone who's positive. Uh, that 
app is scheduled to be out uh, in May. Uh, unlike the CARE 19 app, I'm sure that will raise even more questions about privacy, uh, but the CARE 19 app, which is anonymous, opt-in, you control the data, uh, no sign-in, is a great way that you can help on the, the whole aspect of contact tracing. And uh, perhaps now that, uh, again, great that North Dakota was on the very front edge of this, of any of the states, uh, and nice to see the major uh, technology companies uh, jumping in because, again, uh, technology and location uh, may be one of the tools that will help us get to a, a new normal. In closing today, uh, I want to again go over the, the quick reminder as we head into the holiday weekend about ND Smart. Same guidance we've given everybody before. Uh, <clears throat> the team in the room has heard this dozens of times, but it turns out we've got new viewers that are watching every day. Thank you for tuning in on Good Friday. If you're, today is a holiday and maybe the first time you're watching, under North Dakota Smart, we talk about staying home, staying healthy, and staying connected. Uh, and those basics include great hand hygiene. It, in, it includes uh, only essential travel. We talked before about when you do shop, all the guidelines for that one person plan ahead uh, order if you can uh, <clears throat> we also uh, you know are talking about you know covering your cough if you got symptoms at all please stay at home uh, and you know disinfect and clean services and if you do get out whether it's for a walk uh, or anything this weekend uh, make sure you maintain proper distance and again always also a good idea to wear a mask to protect uh, yourself and protect others so thank you for following uh, this uh, pragmatic guidance which really relies on your self uh, in individual responsibility which we know we have a lot of in North Dakota that's the the nature and the character of North Dakotans uh, is that individual responsibility it's and it's certainly something we take pride in and can, can be proud of because uh, I just want to say you're doing a great job way to go North Dakota uh, keep up the great work <clears throat> And as we uh, close with a, a little uh, gratitude uh, right now, maybe some more at the end after questions, but right now I want to give a special shout out to all the young people in North Dakota. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things that's been uh, a fun bright spot in this job is the uh, <clears throat> is the is all of the fun letters and notes and stuff we're getting from school kids around the state. And I want to uh, give a shout out to a couple uh, siblings actually that sent these in uh, and so th they'll recognize them but one says great the other one says North Dakota smart so I uh, want to say thanks to thanks to all of these guys but I got to read this one on North Dakota smart this comes from Addison age 11 uh, talking about thank you for keeping uh, keeping us safe and he's got safe secure and fearless every day so uh, and uh, and that's a uh, really fun little acronym for safe, secure, and fearless. Great, great for, for North Dakotans to keep in mind. And, and then we've also have uh, from Ava eight, uh, talking about, you know, uh, Thank you for keeping us safe. Appreciate everything you do uh, for me in the world. But COVID-19, you're a gem. Anyway, these are little bright spots. The First Lady and I are getting some of these in. And I want to just say thank you uh, for to these kids uh, because we know that uh, the kids are out there. They're doing great work every day, keeping up with their homework. Homework's an everyday thing right now with distance learning. Uh, but I'm sure they're also playing a role, keeping, their, keeping in touch with their grandparents, keeping their parents happy, uh, doing more chores than maybe they had to do before. Life's changed for everybody, but to all the youth in North Dakota, I want to give a special thank you to you for your important uh, work that you're doing to help keep you, your parents, and your grandparents safe. And thanks for the uh, for, for helping to be North Dakota smart. Uh, we appreciate all that, and we know that future is good hands with the, with the youth of North Dakota. With that, we'll, we'll stand for Good Friday questions. Jack had his hand up first, all the way back. Jack Dura, Bismarck uh, Tribune. Um, can you talk a bit more about the testing plans for Montreal County? Is that, is that set to, to do that, that strike team approach in Montreal County? Uh, the, answer, the answer is yes. And uh, our plan for tomorrow is that is the uh, uh, communications are going to be driven locally versus from this podium uh, to help us uh, make sure that we're uh, targeting uh, all the people in that hot spot that we're trying to reach, uh, you know, versus... Uh, it becoming a regional event. Uh, so the both the National Guard, the Health Department, uh, <clears throat> the tribal leaders, county officials, everybody has said, let us handle the communications locally. Uh, so we're not going to be any more specific than that. Uh, but as you saw on the slide, it's one of the areas where we got a high percentage of positives. Uh, and, and, we're heading, and so we're heading there. The other thing, which again, we're also not really announcing, but we are doing, uh, we have the strike team has been working on a, uh, on 
situations where if we end up with one positive in a long-term care facility, uh, I think we're up to uh, uh, at least three that I know of uh, where we have made uh, come in and organized uh, with the Department of Health, the state, uh, one of the state uh, doctors, epidemiology. We design plans, uh, you know, based on the physical layout of the building. And we come in, we test patients or not residents, we test staff, uh, and we create isolation. And again, uh, working hard to, to in these instances where we, where we get, because this is the skill set we have to have <clears throat> is find a positive, uh, <clears throat> do great contact tracing, do the isolation, uh, and do the quarantining, and that's gonna help us slow the spread. Lane, and then uh, one online. Governor, first I just wanna say thank you to you and the team for the little Easter presents, that was appreciated. Um, the question is, the DOT has moved most of their services online, but they are prohibiting people from ages 65 and older from using those, but the ages 65 and older are the ones most susceptible to this uh, virus, what is there that can be done for those that want to renew their driver's licenses and such? Uh, that's a new one to me. I did not, not know about that one, so I'll have to check. I knew about the first part. I knew we were moving stuff online. I knew that uh, they had completely eliminated the backlog and we'd completed uh, over 350 uh, CDL driver's tests under the new staff standard operating. CDL meaning commercial driver's license, on-road testing with the, the examiners wearing masks, the drivers wearing masks. So I knew they were doing a lot of great work. I did not know about the age limit. I'll have to have my team check on that one. <clears throat> okay, so we'll maybe I'll have an answer before the end of this, but we'll find out, hadn't heard that one. Uh, Question online. Robin Travers is 660KYZ in Williston. What do you and your team need to see in the data to deem it safe to open businesses and potentially schools on April 20th? I what we need, I, what we need to see is not just in the data, uh, we'd, in our data. We'd also have to understand the data of what's happening in the states around us, what's happening in the country. Uh, there's a lot of factors that would go into that because, again, our objective here is to try to find that balance where we want to keep people safe, uh, and then we want to figure out, you know, how we open up. As I said, when we do open up, whatever date that's on, it's not going to open up the way we close down. We close down. Uh, very quickly when we open it up, it's going to be turning the spigot on slowly. Uh, we said uh, that we would, by next Wednesday, provide guidance uh, next uh, Wednesday, April 15th, on whether or not we would extend that from April 20th to further. And I, I don't want to be... Uh, I want to be positive, but I don't want to be overly uh, optimistic or overly encouraging because, uh, it, you know, back... Many states thought that they would be on the downswing by April 20th, and our line is so flat that we haven't even started up yet. And so we may have a flatter, longer curve, uh, and then we're going to have to evaluate that versus what was earlier uh, thought to be you know, a quicker, steeper curve. And, and again, that'll, that'll take some thought on how to do that. I said all along, it's going to take uh, more it's going to be more complex and more challenging to think about how to open up than it was to how to close down. I mean, because opening up uh, the possibility uh, with if we don't have widespread testing, you could be in. You, you, and if you said, "Hey, we got 760,000 people in our state," and even if you multiply by 10 uh, and say there's 10 positives out there for every one we've tested. Uh, and you end up with a small percentage of the people who've been positive and you open things wide up, we could have the whole thing we've been trying to avoid, which is we could have a, a huge, uh, huge crunch of positives, which would then uh, tax our health system. And so the, we, we want to manage this from beginning to end. We don't just want to defer a crisis for a month. And so it, without a cure and without widespread testing, there's a lot of unknowns. And I would say just from a pure... Uh, forecasting and modeling standpoint, there's much more certainty about what's going to happen in the next week than there is going to be what's going to happen in May or June. I mean, the further you go out, the increased amount of uncertainty. Uh, but we will know we'll know a lot more by Wednesday because we're going to start to see whether uh, these curves have flattened in other states and whether or not uh, maybe we can avoid the peak altogether. But uh, <clears throat> stay tuned uh, for April 15th. Thanks, Robin, for the question. Jacob, and then, may, yeah. and then Jacob, then Dave. If I may follow up on that question then, you've uh, repeatedly said that we should assume that the cases are about tenfold what the data says. Uh, without knowing, uh, with the line as flat as it is, what's the likelihood that we're going to hit a peak and not have the data to show it? 
Well, <clears throat> I, I would say that there's a very, given the time frame of when the serology testing, meaning the finger prick kind of testing, where suddenly instead of testing, you know, we get excited when we do 600 or 800 tests a day. Uh, what we really need to have people back to work is being able to test a large percentage of the population in North Dakota, and then people have to, might have to be tested multiple times. I mean, if you're trying to get people back to work uh, in a uh, in a factory situation, you're trying to get you know people to attend a uh, you know a stadium full of people. You might be in a situation where uh, you're you're testing. Uh, to make sure you've got screening to make sure that you're not reintroducing a, a pandemic uh, that is, again, highly contagious, uh, that is, uh, you know, highly contagious. I mean, models are shifting all around us. When I talked to Governor Walsh last night, the new Minnesota model actually increased their R naught. That's the, the rate of infection. They've increased in their model to a four, which would mean that for every one person that gets it, they can transfer it to four other people. We've been through this math before when it was at two, you know, that's two to four to eight to 16 to 32. If it's four, it's four to 16 to 32 to 64 to 120. I mean, you're skipping steps along the way. It's not, I mean, that's for the two. On the four, it goes, it goes four, 16, 64, 256, you know, 1,028. I mean, it, it, you're doubling even more logarithmically. So uh, anyway, it's very, uh, there's a, there'll be a lot of challenging decisions made going forward, given the fact that we've had so few cases so far. I mean, it's great news we have a flat line, but that doesn't tell us that, that wow, it's never going to come here. It just might be coming later here. Dave, you're next. Yes, and this uh, follows along with that, too. Governor Walz has had some pushback from some legislative leaders saying they were hoping they were going to you know, relax these rules he had earlier. And I was just curious, have you gotten any response from legislative leaders here? Are they, are they pushing back at all? Or they, have they tried or are they accepting what's going on in terms of business openings? Well, over the last uh, two days, uh, we've had calls with uh, the House and Senate leaders from both parties. Uh, so as in North Dakota, we're all on a first name basis. So Josh and Joan and Chet and Rich. And we Got, get, always get good suggestions and ideas, and they're constantly pulling uh, information from their caucuses. So we really value those calls and we value the input. Uh, individually, we hear our staff hears regularly from legislators. We've got a very uh, open channels of communication with all of them. And, they're, and I would say that we're hearing, we hear, we hear both sides just like we do from the population. We hear some people that, you know, hey, when are we gonna open up? Can't we open up sooner? We hear others that are saying, hey, are you, are you sure you're doing enough? And, and that's, that's okay. It's, we, we, we love the diversity of opinions uh, because I think our legislature represents the diversity of the opinions in the state and they're representing their constituents. So we appreciate that and value that. I, I would say that the, uh, again, the challenge for us in North Dakota uh, it has, will be when other states that their curve, you know, their peak may have already passed and clearly have passed, and they'll have the data from thousands of cases that they're on the way down, they will start opening up, and we may not be in a position, you know, whether it's us and a few states around us, we may be in a position where we, we're still climbing and they're declining. As it's been said many times at the federal level, there's not one curve for the United States. There's curves for each you know, region or state. And so it'll be very difficult and challenging communication to explain to people you know, why we're still closed down when, say, New York is starting to open up or why Louisiana is opening up. If they can open up, why not us? Well, it's going to be because the ti our timing is different on these things. But we'll, like I said, we'll, each day, the, the models get better every day because each day you've got more actual data to either prove or disprove whether your forecasts and your curves are accurate. Back to, uh, let's say, I, I think I'm going Lane, then online, then Jack, and then Jacob, if I can remember that far ahead, let's say. This is actually for uh, Mylin. Okay, fantastic, thank you. Mylin, come on up. So the other day I had mentioned there was a daycare that had contacted us about they, um, them having providers that have tested positive for COVID-19. They contacted us again and said that they have tried contacting the Department of Health and have gotten no response and are trying to wonder what they can do to properly clean their site and if they're allowed to know that, um, if any of the children have tested positive as well. Just numbers, not names for the kids. 
Um, so on that specific example, I'd like to get the information so that we could reach out to them. I'm not aware of that. I know that we have had some incidents with daycares, and even uh, yesterday there was a lot of focus testing that was done here in this community um, to help protect the children at daycares as well as the healthcare workers. So I'm sorry to hear that, and if you share that information, we'll take care of it and, and really check it out. And Lane, related to that, is that the same daycare that, that you mentioned in a question earlier this week? Okay, I, I would say on that one, I do know that there was a well-coordinated effort uh, between uh, local health officials, state health officials, city of Bismarck. Uh, they tested all the staff, uh, tested a number of the, 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 the kids that were in that daycare, and that was uh, all done and actually had been done the afternoon that you asked me the question, I just hadn't been briefed on it. So uh, again, we'll uh, keep track on that one down, but I know we, I know there's already been work done in that area and we appreciate uh, the provider and everybody locally and coordinating with us to do that. That's the kind of swift action we're looking for is to get in and do that. But the cleaning side and the reopening, uh, Mylin and Chris Jones is still here because child care is managed under the human services. And so we'll get Mylin and Chris in contact with them. <clears throat> Okay, Danny. Question for Chris Jones. Yay, Chris Jones, he is here. <clears throat> Matt Henson with WDAY in Fargo. Regarding shelter for homeless or victims of domestic violence, where should they go and will they be given a voucher for a hotel? And then also, what about people who live in an, in an apartment and have uh, nowhere else to go to isolate? Sure. So as it relates to um, what we're calling our scattered shelter plan, um, we are looking at using hotel vouchers specifically for that. One, to relieve pressure on the capacity in current homeless shelters and for those that need quarantining. And so that those the process will be posted early next week on, on how that will go and it will be organized through the local homeless shelters. It won't be it won't be managed necessarily throughout the state. It's going to be with those community partners, number one. As relates to eviction prevention, we also have a plan for that and we will work through um, different agency partners and would ask at this point for um, those that have questions as it relates to eviction prevention to reach out to the Department of Human Services and Jessica Thomason and we will get them the information that they need as it relates to that specific. With the eviction prevention strategy that we are putting together though, uh, what we mentioned earlier is we wanna be very targeted in how we're approaching eviction prevention. There are already programs available today that we do not wanna supersede or double dip around. And in looking at all the federal programs that are out there as it relates to um, unemployment and the $1,200 stimulus checks, we are using the same eligibility criteria we use for SNAP, which will, we believe the eviction prevention or the pool that would necessarily need to access this program will be, will be small. But we know there is a segment of the population that will need access to these funds in order for them to remain in their apartment or in their um, housing situation. So um, hopefully that answers his question, but it's st most of that information will be coming out also on ND response next week. Lane, is that sorry, right or no, is it no? No, oh, no, no, I'm sorry, no, okay, I gotta go back over here. I think we went you then online, okay. Then Jack, and then who is next, Dave, then no, Jack, Jacob, Dave, okay. Uh, Jack Dura, Bismarck Tribune. Uh, curious, Governor, if the state has thought to deploy its emergency uh, management assistance compact to other states with medical personnel, as for as was done with Hurricane Florence in 2018. I, I couldn't quite, uh, under neither Lindsay or I could hear you, it could be the effectiveness of your mask, but we'll. <clears throat> Uh, does the state plan or has talked about deploying its emergency management assistance compact to other states with medical personnel as was done for Hurricane Florence in 2018? Uh, that, I'm sure that our Department of Emergency Services talked about that over the, the uh, Unified Command, uh, but I haven't been briefed on that. If that's uh, 
anything that's in the works right now. But we'll, we'll put that on our get back to you. But good question. Thanks, Jack. Okay, so, okay, they're saying they did on the EMAC request when we earlier we talked about the 50,000 masks we sent to Montana, that actually came through an EMAC request. So I guess it has been activated, at least in terms of supplies it was sent, but I don't, your question I think related to personnel. And, and so we'll, uh, we can follow up on the personnel side. <clears throat> informally, informally, I would say, we, I think I shared, we had the call with uh, Wyoming, South Dakota, and Montana governors. We all talked to each other and said we would continue to try to support each other here in the region as good neighbors. And as I said, had a great call with Governor Waltz yesterday, uh, talked about and explained to him that <clears throat> when we're doing the, the planning that we're doing, for the hospital planning, which we'll talk about next week, and the surge planning, that we're really in our planning, including all those northwestern Minnesota counties as part of the North Dakota plan, because those people in those counties would be receiving uh, health care uh, from uh, either All True or or Sanford, or, and if you ended up at Sanford in Bemidji and you said, hey, you need another level of care, you know, someone might be transferred from Bemidji to Fargo. So that, that is all, you know, so with Essentia, all true, everything. Uh, and we also talked about, too, with, the, <clears throat> with Governor Walsh's understanding that uh, because of the way <clears throat> The pharmacy laws are in North Dakota, uh, a Walgreens in East Grand Forks and in, <clears throat> and in, and in Moorhead do sell drugs and perhaps a lot of them the North Dakotans that go across to get their prescriptions filled at either at a Walgreens or Walmart in in Minnesota so we've got pharmacies on one side we've got hospitals on other in Breckenridge it's flipped where the hospital for Wapathan is in Breckenridge and so as he and I talked about it we you know we, these are these are communities uh, where the we have to really make sure that the border is invisible uh, because we have to care for people on both sides and we're, we're planning uh, there and we also talked about is there other areas of potential potential collaboration between North Dakota and Minnesota when it comes to the, the widespread serology testing. Uh, and so we'll, we'll continue to stay in regular contact to see if there's ways we can work together for the benefit of the, the citizens of both our states uh, who live and work across a virtually invisible border for most of the time, whether if you're a nurse living in Minnesota and working at a Fargo or Grand Forks hospital, or if you're a nurse living in Wapton that works in Breckenridge, uh, school teachers, yeah, you know, people are moving back and forth and probably never spend a minute thinking that they're crossing the border multiple times a day uh, as part of that, and we got to keep it that way. <clears throat> Jacob? Governor, we've confirmed that a church in Dickinson will be holding in-person services this weekend. Warning if you had a message for them and if they may face legal repercussions for doing so. Well, as I said in my opening remarks, I mean, our country was founded on freedom of religion. We've gotten guidelines, uh, you know, asking people to, uh, you know, to practice safe distancing, uh, use innovative approaches, and uh, to keep with groups less than 10. Uh, but there's going to be no legal action taken against uh, anyone that uh, would decide to uh, Ha have you know hold a service but again i would encourage people to think uh, particularly if they as part of those operating procedures they may think about those that are uh, th those individuals that are at uh, risk be either because of age or underlying conditions uh, might want to dial in for that service uh, versus show up because as i said we do have we do have uh, uh, cases in North Dakota where there have been a cluster of double digit cases that have all been traced back to one congregation. We know that from other states, whether it's funerals or church services, this is a place where you've got vulnerable populations uh, sitting close to each other. So it's a, it's a, it's a high risk activity that we're uh, uh, hoping that people would follow the guidelines, but uh, we also uh, <clears throat> understand and respect uh, what this country was based on but each each individual that you know belongs to that I, I would also because of the individual rights of in our country each individual should make a decision about whether they want to place themselves or their loved ones in a potential risk situation as well so back to individual responsibility dave i have just one more quick clarification for chris if i could and this chris jones is coming back with a clarifying question from You mentioned hotel rooms. So, so are there other uh, facilities that you're looking at in terms of the housing inventory that you have for the homes? Uh, no, actually, just primarily looking at housing inventory at the eight largest communities across the state to take the pressure off of the current shelters today. It would be hotel rooms, basically. Correct. Yep. 
again, for uh, the sort of, I'm going to say the uncharted territories we're in, whether it's housing, uh, and we have federal funds that are coming in. Uh, I think philosophically, there's uh, many people like myself that would uh, have always believed in free markets and uh, and have, haven't uh, been one to support or advocate or cheer for you know, large federal stimulus programs. But, you know, this is a completely different situation we're in. We're in a situation where, for the first time in the history of America, businesses have closed because the 50 governors in the state have mandated that they do. And and when those businesses closed, people were thrown in unemployment. So whether you're, regardless of your political ideology, we're in uncharted territory and that uh, those of us that believe in free markets uh, intervene in a way to try to save lives by closing businesses. And when doing that, I think we've got a special responsibility to try to, to take care of those people that were thrown into uh, economic chaos as we tried to prevent uh, a health calamity. The solutions that Chris and his team are coming up with, what are utilizing the federal dollars which are being allocated to the states, I think are smart because rather than us going out and creating new government programs, we're using existing programs, funneling money. We're not creating new nonprofits. We're funneling through existing. And if the solution involves uh, hotels, which right now have got really low occupancy and are really struggling, and this is the way we can take some of those stimulus dollars and put dollars back into those existing businesses, that's smart business uh, that we're in terms of, of how we're doing that and in terms of the uh, trying to prevent homelessness with some of the funding uh, going through those programs, that actually supports uh, people that are in the business of providing low-income housing because you know where people are going to drop out of the bottom end of the system might already be in what would be considered uh, you know Section 8 housing. And then all of a sudden, they're dropping off the bottom of going from Section 8 to homelessness. We put pressure on a nonprofit that's running a shelter. Uh, we'd rather take some of these federal dollars and make sure we can support that Section 8 affordable housing. The good news is we haven't required a lot of that in North Dakota, but the people that have it, it's essential for them. So I like what they're doing because it's it's supporting, uh, trying to maintain a little bit of stability in the private sector and the nonprofit sector of those people that were in this business anyway. So I, I like I like how we're directing this. We're not expanding government. We're, we're helping people in the need of help, but we're doing that by supporting them and supporting the private sector. Uh, online. Alan Burke with the Emmons County Record. With Medicare and most health insurance companies now covering teletherapy, how can people find behavioral health counsel counselors who do teletherapy? Uh, the, if not through your own uh, provider, I would steer people back to the uh, <clears throat> North Dakota uh, Behavioral Health website as part of the Department of Health. Uh, and there are a number of uh, hotlines that are there uh, that people can call. Uh, and and we can, again, if not helping, if people are in immediate need, call one of the helplines, uh, like whether it's Recovery Talk or the other ones, we'll keep publishing all of those. Uh, Chris, maybe, I don't know if you've got other advice on that, but I would say we'll keep publishing those. So talk to your provider or con check the uh, website or call one of the hotlines because we know that there's a demand, increased demand, and we want to make sure that we're connecting people with uh, with providers. Uh, that can, And again, uh, great success happening uh, with uh, behavioral health and counseling sessions happening on on uh, Skype or Teams or Zoom or just even the good old phone call. Uh, again, make sure that if you're str struggling, make sure you're talking to somebody and 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 uh, call one call one of the lines that's available. Back to Jack. Uh, a 2015 TED Talk by Bill Gates has drawn some attention for you know his proposed response to a pan uh, to a, a virus pandemic. He, of course, is a former colleague of yours. Just curious if you've spoken with or consulted him since since uh, the outbreak has emerged in North Dakota. Yeah, when it first uh, got going, I had an hour-long one-on-one with uh, with Bill, and and the topic was largely around uh, modeling uh, was the was the key because uh, they've done a lot of work around uh, modeling uh, the Gates Foundation and of course there are some of the world some of the world's experts I mean the foundation probably you should think of the foundation not the way we would think of a regular foundation you should think of the uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation as one of the top uh, virus pandemic 
uh, health organizations in the world. I mean, they've got 4,000 plus employees. They've got a, some of the world's top scientists. They, they're on the front edge of almost, uh, you know, coming very close to eradicating polio in the world, uh, in the work that they're doing around the world. So they've got a lot of uh, sophisticated knowledge uh, around this and, and, and uh, it always uh, good to go, you know, directly to the source and, and get a chance to visit with someone who's uh, really put his life into uh, his post Microsoft life and really in many ways that's been going on since 2000. So almost 20 years worth of work of uh, probably he's an individual with the work of the foundation that saved more lives, saved more lives than any human being on the planet in terms of the work of the foundation. I mean, it's literally millions and millions of people of lives have been saved in, in some of the world's poorest country because of the work they're doing on, on sanitation, on health and on uh, vaccine development. Uh, and I and I would guess as we come out the backside of this and vaccines are being developed, they'll uh, they'll be playing a, a a a visible role because there's a just like a think of it like a university research center uh, that's incredibly well founded. You know, the, that's they're not just a grant distributing organization; they're funding uh, very actively some of the leading edge research. And I, I would say that you know, separate from the conversation with Bill, but but on this idea of research and vaccines, when we're when we're busy as a nation throwing out trillions of dollars in stimulus to try to save the economy, and then you say, why did we end up with this? We ended up with this because. Uh, is so far in the world, whether it's the seasonal flu, which kills, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of people every year, uh, or whether it's other viruses, uh, and the threat of a pandemic is always there, then, you know, why wouldn't we do as a country do a Manhattan Project, uh, if you will, referencing when we put all the energy of our nation behind uh, atomic research, why wouldn't we do a Manhattan Project around, you know, really unlocking the keys uh, to figuring out how do we quickly develop vaccines to stop deadly viruses? And it would seem to me that that would be uh, one of the things uh, that we could do as a nation. And uh, one of the things when we're, you know, when we're, you know you're busy handed out you know, 500 billion here and 500 billion there, it starts to add up to real money, as they say. And so, you know, why wouldn't we get behind a really large, you know, vaccine project? Uh, because it's been, uh, you know, small research projects or organizations like the Gates Foundation, which on the scale of all government spending, even though the Gates Foundation is large, the largest foundation in the world, it's a fraction of what governments spend globally. And I think it would be a great thing for this whole planet to sit down afterwards and, and say, you know, wow, why why wouldn't we why wouldn't we spend uh, you know pour the kind of money into solving the vaccine crisis if that's what's going to turn our world upside down uh, like nothing ever has before so that's that's separate from the bill conversation but again a very uh, very constructive and helpful conversation to talk to somebody who's probably spent more time thinking about pandemics than just about anybody else on the planet other than the you know epidemiologists <clears throat> Okay, uh, and last one, done. Questions, okay, going once, going twice. Okay, we'll, uh, with gratitude uh, here, we'll uh, close out again. Uh, I just wanna say uh, to everybody as you head into the Easter uh, holiday weekend uh, that I hope that everybody has got, uh, taking the time to be uh, patient with the fact that we have to exercise uh, physical distance during a time when we wanna be together, uh, that we have to, uh, as we live with disruptions to our daily work lives and school lives, uh, that through that you know connection and renewing renewing faith and renewing connection to family, uh, we can find all the things uh, for which we can be grateful in our state. Uh, and whether that's uh, you know clean air or or great food, uh, fantastic neighbors, uh, uh, incredible way of life, or the fact that it, at least so far, we're, we live in one of the places that's been least affected by the global pandemic. Uh, and even as disruptive as we have been uh, to be where we are right now, we also have to count our blessings uh, that we have had, we are where we are geographically, and we've been collectively as a state taking the steps we've taken uh, to reduce uh, the impact of this from a health standpoint. And again, I just want to say on behalf 
behalf of the First Lady and myself, Lieutenant Governor Brent Sanford, and all the leaders in state government, we thank uh, all the individuals of the state who are doing their part uh, as individuals, as parents, as business owners, as teachers, as health care providers, uh, to help make sure that we accomplish what we set out to do, and that's to care for those that are most vulnerable in our state, the 20% of the people that this uh, disease would be the most deadly. Uh, you're, you are making a difference in their lives, whether, you, whether it's a grandparent that you know or an individual you don't. And again, we want to head into this weekend and just saying, again, thank you for all you're doing. Uh, because of the low numbers we had today, uh, we are planning on not having uh, a a press briefing tomorrow, Saturday. We will put out uh, press releases, so the press can look for those. Uh, we do not plan to have one on Sunday, uh, so we'll see you back here Monday at 3.30, uh, unless there's uh, some kind of emergency that would cause us. We'll notify you, give you ample hours ahead of time if there's some kind of emergency, but right now we're uh, hoping that everyone uh, can enjoy the holiday weekend, but know that the uh, state of North Dakota, our state health department team, the testing team, the lab team, uh, the governor's office, and all the cabinet leaders are going to continue to be working around the clock, as is the National Guard and lots of other folks that are out uh, busy working, whether it's testing this weekend or keeping things going or doing data collection. A lot of folks are going to be working, and I want to say thanks to uh, the team of people that, that haven't had a day off in the last uh, month, uh, including all those that work in the governor's office. I want to thank all of them for their great work on uh, policy and community communications and but I would uh, hope that we're in a spot right now where the uh, we can get through the weekend uh, with just uh, news release updates and meanwhile uh, when we when we create when we stop doing these we know that that creates a vacuum uh, and when we we didn't have any last weekend that was a breeding ground for misinformation uh, so we would encourage people to uh, over the weekend again if you've got questions uh, to uh, check the uh, the ndresponse.gov, that's the one site that becomes the pointer to get you to the health department, all the other programs, all the great work that's going on in commerce. And, and with that, I'd say, uh, hope you all have a blessed Easter. Uh, hope all of your family members are, are healthy and safe. And we'll see you Monday at 3.30. Thank you. Happy Easter. Mm -hmm.